It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 128, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. John Stoddard and Lindsay Allen work together at Higher Ground Farm, a rooftop farming operation with two locations in Boston, Massachusetts. John is the founder of the business and operates the site at the Boston Design Center, where he's farmed since 2013, and Lindsay runs the new site at the Boston Medical Center. Higher Ground Farm sells to restaurants and direct to consumers and provides produce to the Boston Medical Center cafeteria, patient food service, and a preventative food pantry. We dig into the fundamentals of rooftop farming, including options for different production systems and why Higher Ground has opted for the system they use. John and Lindsay provide insights into the surprising ecology of rooftop farming, including weeds and seagulls, and discuss soil fertility management and irrigation systems. John and Lindsay also ruminate on how to find a roof to farm on, what it takes for an urban farm to survive, and how they've leveraged the rooftops to create relationships with customers and clients. And we examine the two different business models that Higher Ground uses to make their operation work, growing food for sale, as well as operating a rooftop farm for a management fee. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, and lightweight for less compaction. And they're easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com. And by Coolbot by Store It Cold. You can build an affordable walk in cooler powered by a Coolbot and a window air conditioning unit. Save up to 83% on upfront costs and up to 42% on monthly electrical bills compared to conventional cooling systems. And by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. John Stoddard and Lindsay Allen, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So glad you could join me here on a Sunday afternoon. I really appreciate your making the time. Again, typical farmers, right? No, no boundaries. <laughs> Yep. Guilty. (laughs) I'd like to start off by having you guys tell us a little bit about Higher Ground Farm, where you guys are located and what you're doing there. Yeah. So Higher Ground Farm um, is a rooftop farm. Uh, Well, now we're two rooftop farms um, in Boston. And our first location is on the Boston Design Center in the Seaport uh, neighborhood of Boston. Uh, it's really one of these up and coming neighborhoods of Boston. And, um, you know, we, we signed our lease back in 2013, um, was probably great timing for us. Cause sort of right after that is when a lot of restaurants and hotels and et cetera started coming in. Um, so we are, our, our space, um, at the Boston design center is actually a little over an acre. Uh, we're not growing on that entire space currently. We only really have about 2,000 square feet of planted space, but there's certainly uh, room for growth there. Um, so we've been, we like I said, started in 2013 and really operated for several years uh, selling to restaurants and also through a farm stand um, at the ground level for the folks that work in the building. There's probably about 2,000 or so people that work in the building. Um, and then... Um, well, I was farming with, uh, a, par- a business partner of mine, Courtney, who left after three years to really start a family and left Boston, left Boston. And then this year in, in 2017, uh, we began managing a, a brand new roof farm at, uh, Boston medical center, which is not far from our, uh, sort of flagship location. It's in would be considered a uh, Roxbury neighborhood or, or the South end. Um, and that is when Lindsay came on um, to, you know, join our team. And um, she's, she's the farm manager over at Boston medical center. Yeah. So this is really higher grounds first uh, farm offside of the main campus there. And we um, started at the end of April. So a little bit late, into the growing season, but we have been farming there now for about two months and it's the, the roof itself is about 7,000 square feet and we're growing on about 2,300 um, square feet of grow space, which makes us the biggest rooftop farm in Boston, which we are very excited about. Uh, and we are the kind of goal of this farm was we were approached a uh, higher ground farm was approached by Boston medical center 
um, and they were wanting to grow local um, organic food for their patients and for they have a preventative food pantry on site. So they were wanting to grow for that as well. And as part of BMC, BMC is really new to me in terms of what they're doing. Boston, that's Boston Medical Center. And this farm is part of, I think, of a larger bundle of um, their kind of dedication to the environment and to a holistic approach to um, health care for their patients. And so they it's they don't have any experience in farming. And so they kind of have looked to John and I to um, hold that down for them. And it's been a really interesting experience. And so right now we're about a month into harvesting and are splitting our food going between the uh, kitchen, which from the kitchen, it then goes to the um, cafeteria for visitors, for patients, for staff of the hospital. And then it also goes to the patient plate. So actually into uh, the hospital uh, rooms where patients are staying. And then the other half of the produce goes over to the preventative food pantry. And so we're trying to provide a lot of the greens. Uh, and then now we're coming on to, of course, tomatoes and our um, other summer crop for the food pantry as well. And trying to add more of a rounded um, offering than just canned vegetables and more of the processed things that are often available in a food pantry there. Um, and I think just to kind of give you a more complete picture of, of what's going on with food there is that they, we also have um, a demonstration kitchen on, at site on BMC that works every day offering free cooking classes to, and it reflects what's um, being given out that day in the pantry, which I think is really important to making sure that the food is actually used because sometimes we're giving maybe different ingredients that aren't normally part of a palate that someone who is used to a CSA would know what to do or someone who is used to eating a more localized uh, seasonal diet. And so we have this amazing demonstration kitchen that does cooking classes. It does, um, it also does diet specific classes. So for cancer survivors, it does classes around that. It does classes for diabetes patients, for youth, for whole family cooking. Uh, and I think for me, that's a really fun piece to this whole farm is that food makes it a much fuller picture. And I think a holistic approach to um, nutrition at the hospital. So yeah, that's just yeah. a little glimpse of, of what we're doing. There's some education pieces to the farm as well, but yeah. Yeah. And I, I would just add uh, to what Lindsay said in that, um, Boston Medical Center is located in a neighborhood uh, that's, you know, what, what you might call underserved. Uh, there's mm -hmm. there's not as many grocery stores there. Uh, people uh, tend to be lower income. Um, so this is a way that Boston Medical Center, through the things Lindsay was describing, having that preventative food bank, having these cooking classes, um, you know, is increasing access to really the best food. I mean, producing beautiful food there organically um, and 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 making that accessible to folks that that might not be able to afford it or they it might not even exist in their neighborhood so uh, it's a really powerful thing i think that that Boston medical center is doing um and that we're really you know happy to to be a part of i think that's really great you know just a couple of weeks ago we were talking to ray tyler out in tennessee and he had a he had a daughter who got very sick she got cancer uh, when she was really young and they completely upended their diet even on their on an organic vegetable farm. They completely upended their diet. Yeah. And he talked about some of the challenges with doing that. And I think, you know, when you talk about reaching out into the community, you know, it's, it's one thing to make those kinds of changes to your diet that somebody might say you need to do when you got cancer, if you already know how to cook and know yeah. how to cook with vegetables. And so I think it is really important to provide that kind of support for people rather than just saying, eat more produce you know, eat more fresh food. And just giving it to them doesn't necessarily mean they're going to use it or know how to use it. So, you know, like Lindsay was saying, being able to ha tie in that demonstration kitchen, um, I think is, is really, you know, a comprehensive way to, to address this stuff. Now is higher ground farm, a for-profit company, are you guys a nonprofit? How does, how does that work? Yeah, so I was going to actually mention this is kind of a departure for us this year. Um, we really were operating as like a seed to sale business where we're we're growing and and, and selling food. Um, and so the model here with with Boston Medical Center is a little different because they're paying a management fee. Um, so you know they're paying uh, higher ground to to run this. Um, 
which is different than than what we've we've previously done. And, you know, I'm starting to think as, you know, Lindsay was talking just um, the differences and in what it takes for a urban farm to survive. Um, and so I think it's it's pretty different from what um, you know, what you'll see in a in a traditional farm. Um, there's opportunities and there's also barriers. So, um, you know, it's just to explore sort of the business model or even the concept of urban farming and how to make it work. I think there's a lot of those questions about, you know, is it a nonprofit? Is it a, is it a for-profit? Um, how, you know, and I can talk forever on this, so I'll, I'll keep it brief, but I'm just saying it's, it's interesting. I think we're all looking, and I think across the country, as you're seeing more urban agriculture, that question of what is the business model, how to make it work, um, and yeah. how to make it not an elitist thing as well. Right. And I think that's what's interesting about these partnerships that are starting to emerge with hospitals is there is in larger institutions is there is so much money within hospitals to support initiatives like this. Or even if it's not an exact farm, then where is um, supporting through their purchases, like redirecting large amounts of fun and funds to localized food economies. And that's what's exciting for me, looking at changing the way hospitals um, invest in the way hospitals uh, buy is, and I think that that's a really emergent market for um, different urban agricultural partnerships because there is a lot of money in hospitals that I think a lot of people know about but maybe haven't quite tapped into. And I think I think we'll see a large, hopefully, a large increase in growth in that area in those partnerships. It's definitely a win-win situation. So I, I'm curious when you talk about partnering with and marketing to a hospital. Are there increased food safety demands from them? And, and how are you guys meeting that? Because obviously you're dealing with a, an at-risk population. That's really, uh, we've been lucky and not having to deal with that because we, we do a first wash on the farm there and then it goes to the kitchen and they actually process and wash everything there. So we've been extremely fortunate um, to not have to really deal with that on our end, that the kitchen has a wash station within their own uh, kitchen. So I basically harvest on site, do an initial wash, um, and then I have about a 10 minute walk maze <laughs> through the hospital um, and deliver it to their uh, large kitchen, which then processes it there. And, and then just to, to back up a little bit. So tell me about rooftop farming. What what does that look like at Higher Ground Farm? How do you guys have the soil arranged on top of these roofs? We worked with um, Recover Green Roof, which is kind of the leading um, company in Boston doing green roofs. They do edible roofs and they also do, you know, commercial, residential. They're amazing. And they work um, with Vermont Composting Company, which I know is a sponsor of your podcast here. And we we love them. Um, so they we are actually working completely out of milk crates. And at first, as uh, my history in farming is in um, suburban and rural farming, all in ground. I've never done anything like this before. So I was definitely kind of guffawed at the thought of farming out of milk crates and thought, oh, what, like an, if not, I was had no expectations of large amounts of food, but there's an unbelievable amount of food coming off of this farm right now. Um, but we, so we went with milk crates as opposed to doing raised beds for a number of reasons. One being that um, it's considered a temporary structure. So there's a, um, less of a permitting process and a, a lot less of a yeah, legal process to go through if you're using milk crates. And so these milk crates are then lined with a recycled um, plastic uh, fabric. And it, so it allows for drainage, airflow, and, and does an air pruning of the roots on the side. And then it, we use a blend from Vermont Composting Company uh, in each of those crates. And so we have, you know, the farm divided up into different rows. There are four, four rows um, or sections, and there's four rows within a section. And then we have our irrigation system on top of that. And we were able to, we set up the whole farm in, what, John, like six or seven hours with 15 of us. Um, I, think Vermont, it like, huh? I think it was like four hours. <laughs> yeah, it was the only year. It's even Pretty less quick. than that. Um, the Vermont Composting Company basically filled the crates for us at their site in Vermont, shipped them here. We have a freight elevator um, in the building where that our roof is on. And so we then had a really great 
uh, team from Recover Roof and and from Higher Ground and Bucket Brigaded uh, all like 2,300 crates out there and then took another week to set up irrigation and those finer details um, like that. And so it's definitely right now we're working, you know, with our initial year, beautiful um, fertility because of the blend from Vermont Composting Company. And next year we'll definitely be needing to uh, top dress and, and work a little bit more on the nutrient levels and possibly get a dosatron for the system um, to supplement for nutrients and minerals and stuff. Are you using an off the shelf mix from Vermont Compost Company or did you have them do a custom blend for you? We're using an off the shelf mix, but we're um, they were actually just out last week uh, with us and we're definitely talking uh, like what could be different, what's working, what's not. And because they're definitely seeing this emergent market with more container farming and rooftop farming. Um, and I believe I'm correct in I, Recover Roof is the one who sourced and did the um, purchasing and buying for us of the, you know, through it was kind of the liaison with Vermont Composting Company, but I believe it was, um, I don't think it was a custom blend for our roof, if I'm correct. No, it's the same. It's, it's, yeah, it's their, I'm forgetting the brand name, but you I can see like it on their website. Plus or whatever. Yeah. Um, and Chris, just if, if, in case you're interested, uh, wanted to give you a little background on sort of how we came to this uh, uh, milk crate method, which which actually Recover has branded um, with a with its with its own name. I'm, I'm forgetting what they what they call it now. But um, when when we were looking to set up the original um, higher ground, we were really looking at doing a green roof farm. Um, so I'm not sure you know how familiar you or your or your, your listeners are with, you know, the different options. Obviously you can do a uh, greenhouse on a roof. You can do um, hydroponics. Um, and then the other sort of big option would be a green roof system. Um, and that's what recover green roofs installs is green roofs. Um, but it's, it's, you're using a different type of media, obviously to grow vegetables. Um, but it's a whole system that really you're not planting in, in containers. You're planting literally like, you create sort of the ground up on the roof. Um, and there's different, there's different advantages and different, uh, and disadvantages. Um, if you have, if you're, if you have a green roof farm, like you can ex see an example of that at a uh, Brooklyn Grange farm, that's the type of farming they do on, on roofs. Right. That's really just soil placed on the roof directly. Exactly. Yeah. It's a system of layers. So you have basically like a pond, a pond liner that goes down sort of a root barrier. And then you're putting down all these other layers for drainage, et cetera, and insulation. And then you put a, a, a special media that um, it has less organic matter in it. And it's, I think there's more sort of uh, like, like rock and whatnot in there to be able to, um, make it so the soil doesn't blow away. Um, so that's, that's, that's great in the sense that you're, you, it's really pretty traditional as far as uh, being able to use, uh, you know, tools like cedars, et cetera, on the, on the farm. When you use the container method, it can be certainly less expensive. And some of the, some of the other reasons that Lindsay mentioned, like, like uh, permitting, permitting, et cetera, cause it's more of a, it's a, it's a mobile, you could move them at any time. Um, and then it, you're allowed, the media you use is, is, has more organic matter, better for plants. Um, and so, you know, we sort of weighed all these options and ultimately back, you know, in 2013 decided to go with this milk crate method. Um, and it, it works, it has its issues, but it works. And, um, you know, recover has gone on to, to install, uh, the same system on, uh, on a few other roofs and, um, and now here at Boston Medical Center. Um, so, you know, I think like Lindsay was saying, it's sort of um, not what you might be used to if you're used to farming um, at, you know, on a traditional farm, but, um, you know, you sort of learn different ways to make it work and you got to, you know, be creative all the time. Yeah, and Recover Green Roof has done uh, over the past few years, some different studies and been observing there, basically the, a raised bed system, the container system, and then the open media. So just covering a roof with 
media and seeing which ones grow better. And they said by far the um, milk crate containers um, outproduce um, all the other methods. And basically, as you're, if you're thinking of these containers, the root, I mean, it's like they're growing in butter practically. You know, there's the tilth of the soil is beautiful. Um, and they, you're not losing a lot of the topsoil to like wind scour and, and things like that. So uh, we definitely they found uh, with some great observation over the past few years that the milk crate method outproduces any other uh, form of rooftop farming in terms of container. And I think it's it's important in this to, to note that the Vermont compost potting soil is a compost based potting soil with the fertility in the soil. So it's not a hydroponic system. It's it's not like you're growing in an inert medium and then adding fertility through the water no, system. You're actually growing not. on the soil. Mm-hmm. Right. And that to me as a farmer is really important is to be working with living soil. And that's why I think Vermont composting company is so amazing and why I think that our food is growing so fast and so abundantly. And I always say when I'm giving tours of this farm too, especially working with hospitals is like, we want to be giving patients nutrient dense food. And just like we are what we eat, our plants are what our soil is. And so we have this amazing high quality soil blend by Vermont composting company and therefore are getting a much higher quality output product if, if we were to be, you know, compared to some other kind of potting soil or if we were doing hydroponics or something there. Sure. So we definitely have a superior uh, vegetable product coming out of there because of that. Now at the Boston Design Center, you've had plants in milk crates for a long time now. Have you guys used essentially the same system there of having Vermont Compost Company fill your your milk crates for you and, and then bringing them up on top of the design center or or... Did you go about things differently there? <laughs> um, you know, it's similar and different. Um, we really started, uh, we had to raise money for this project. So we, we had a Kickstarter campaign. Um, it was different than Boston Medical Center um, who, you know, funded, funded the farm. They built the farm uh, and paid for it. Uh, so that you, we were able to, um, I, I would say for, for the original site, we, we really kind of, scrapped it together the best we could we actually built our own um uh planters so we we got soil delivered um and we we used a local company not vermont not vermont uh compost um and so we had soil delivered we basically put all our planters together filled them with soil and we uh put them on pallets to be shrink wrapped and then we had a, a crane come um, and lift all the pallets to the roof uh, one by one. And we set up the farm that way. Um, so the same, you know, similar and different. And we've used Vermont compost at our flagship site um, uh, when we, we expanded a bit and bought soil from them. And we've also bought their compost blend. Um, and as Lindsay said, they recently came out to Boston Medical Center. And so they're really, they're interested in learning more about this and, and trying to, you know, problem solve. Um, and so I think they're going to be coming out to the original site to take a look there and see, um, you know, how things are going and, and offer solutions to, you know, some issues we have um, up there. But yeah, essentially, you know, it's, it's similar, but, you know, it's been refined. So like when we were, putting our farm together in 2013, uh, or, you know, earlier, it was, it, it, you know, in the past four years, um, I think recover has, has really sort of refined the way they do things. Um, but it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to have Vermont compost filling them for us and them showing up ready to be installed. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was great to do it the way we did it. We did it with really with volunteers uh, do you know, filling everything. Um, but certainly sort of a less efficient system. Um, and if you can, you know, if you have the funds to do it um, and have someone else do it, that's, that's great. Um, but you know, when we got started, it was really us with limited money trying to make this project happen. So we did it really all ourselves. Now you said you actually built the containers yourself at the Boston design center. Just meaning we we ordered uh, milk crates, had those delivered, and then we uh, used a landscape fabric to line them. 
Um, we had we cut strips and stapled them in and all this stuff uh, and then filled them with the soil ourselves. So it was just, you know, we were really um, involved from sort of at, at all the stages of building the farm uh, with Recover Green Roofs Assistance. Um, they they have the experience with, you know, with the crane and being able to signal and whatnot, what you, all the things you need to do when you have a, a crane there. Um, so they came in for the day of install, but we really sort of built the planters ourselves from the landscape fabric and the, the milk crates and the soil. I always think one of the interesting things about growing things in pots is that you, you know, you actually see the fact that the soil is being transformed into plants because the uh, as you continue to harvest, the soil continues to, to be less and less and less every year. With the planters that you've been managing over a long period of time, are you just adding additional soil on top? Is that how you're managing your fertility there? We haven't lost a, t- a lot of soil. Um, you know, fertility is is an issue and concern that I, you know, continue to grapple with and, and you know, we're... Uh, and, you know, want to work with Vermont compost and others, um, more on it. You know, we, we add compost every year, but you know, we haven't lost a significant amount of soil. So we're not buying and refilling planters necessarily. Um, yeah, yeah. go ahead, Lindsay. No, I was just saying in Vermont composting, like they just brought us, um, they have a great composting blend for topping off and side dressing for container mixes. And so we'll be using that to supplement, um, where needed when we are actually losing soil and then the you know nutrients that's taken up this year um so we'll be using their blend to kind of top top off and side dress where needed are you also adding additional fertility or are you just really counting on the potting soil and the and the compost that you're top dressing with to provide your crop fertility so that's our main um yeah, main way that we're doing that, we're also considering getting a dosatron um, and we'll probably, I don't foresee this year needing to possibly in the fall do a little bit of um, top dressing, but I think next year um, I'll probably start uh, making some composting teas and, um, you know, adding and doing, playing around with that. We also are doing worm composting on the farm too. So I'm experimenting with uh, that, but it'll be mostly um, top dressing with and Vermont Composting Company, but that was kind of the conversation we started with them last week on the farm is how do we, um, how will we move forward in, um, yeah, growing our soil, keeping nutrients in the soil and, um, and yeah, moving forward with this. It's definitely a new area in terms of larger production in this way. So there's not a lot of like rule books out there for it at this point. And what crops are you growing? I mean, it, I imagine you're growing some of everything, but where are you focusing your energy? So when I was planning this, um, this uh, farm for this year, I was really looking because with rooftop farming and with most urban agriculture, you're, you're really every square inch is important and counts. And so that's for me is what's been kind of fun of getting innovative of how are we stacking the succession and time and space and getting really creative with that and really efficient with that. And so my goal was to look at focusing on crops that are either, um, you know, continual harvest or that are just fast in the ground. So in and out. And so doing a lot of greens, um, a lot of cutting greens and salad mixes for the hospital goes through a lot of that for salads for the patient plate and the cafeteria. Um, And then like we have collards, kale, chard, um, for kind of continual harvest. So we do bundles of those for the food pantry. Uh, we do a lot of lettuce heads and then um, doing um, tomato. I mean, the usual suspects, <laughs> tomatoes, eggplants, uh, peppers, you know, hot peppers and some different bells and summer squash, zucchini, cucumbers, uh, lots of green beans, uh, radishes, carrots, um, some scallions. What else do we have? Um, and then, you know, in the spring, we were doing a lot of spinach and arugula, um, but really focusing on, yeah, what can we, um, what will grow quick, we can kind of get in and out, and then what can we continually harvest from, and what, and then I'm trying to look a lot at, like, what's happening, obviously, above ground and below ground of, like, pushing, trying to push the limits of 
um, companion planting and uh, with you know sneaking in root crops here and there next to other things and um, getting creative in that way. And is that similar to the approach that that you guys have followed at at the design center, John? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, we we started out thinking, you know, we were going to be growing tomatoes, greens, and herbs primarily for restaurants. Um, when we we kind of decided to do this farm stand um, in our second year because, you know, we wanted to take advantage of the fact that we had 2000 people down there that, you know, eat vegetables, too. Um, so we we decided to diversify and, and grow a greater variety. So, you know, growing a lot of the things that that Lindsay mentioned and really trying to, um, you know, both serve the restaurant market and the you know the farmer the the farm stand market as well and you know i'd say it's one that's one of the toughest things as far as the as as the higher ground at you know the design center site is is really gauging what folks will buy you know you have a you have a crop rotation in mind and you don't want to be growing the same thing over and over again but certain restaurants want the same thing over and over again and then so, you know, it, it's just a tricky, tricky sort of balancing act of trying to um, keep the farm and the soil healthy uh, while also, you know, satisfying your market. And one way we really addressed that last year was we partnered with one restaurant um, with this chef that from uh, Select Oyster. Um, and they were great because he just basically took whatever we were growing. Um, and so I didn't have to deal with sort of having beautiful charge to sell, but not enough customers. Um, but it's different at Boston Medical Center because they're really, um, you know, taking the lead from from us in terms of what we're growing and, and they're and they're doing their best to to use it and, you know, offer it at the at the food pantry as well. Yeah, this has definitely been our like this is our we're considering our growing year at Boston Medical Center because the first year and for the chefs, it's definitely they have amazing chefs and kitchen there that are, I think are really progressive for a hospital. Um, and this is totally new. So we're trying to really work out those kinks of like how of what works for them, what what crops and where can they be flexible and where do we need to be more flexible? And then we didn't have very much lead time at all in terms of, or I'll speak for myself in terms of when I was hired and then when things need to be in the ground. So I look forward to next year. I wanted, you know, to talk to more of the kind of have an exit poll of the food pantry to see what more culturally appropriate crops can we be growing for the food pantry that would also then work well on a rooftop because there are some things that wouldn't make sense for a rooftop. So it's definitely a balance of, of what can make sense for a roof and then what is it that either if we're working with chefs in the kitchen or then the, um, you know, the food pantry itself that people are going to use. What kinds of crops don't make sense on a rooftop? I think a lot of uh, one-time harvest, you know, I'm not going to waste time with broccoli, um, you know, um, any cabbage, things that are going to be sitting in the ground for longer. I cut it once and then I ha and then there's an empty space there. And so that's why I've been focusing on things that I can continuously harvest that occupy that space or that aren't occupying that space for a long time. Because if I have a, you know, if I'm growing a row of cabbage, it sits there for two, three months and then I harvest it and then I have to wait again. And so I, I'm trying to go for, yeah, the quicker, quicker returns like bok choys and, um, you know, salad mixes lettuce heads, um, and then our collards, kale, chard, things like that. Or, you know, the, you know, tomatoes where I can continue to harvest for a little while off of those and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my personal philosophy. Just it, that seems to be logical in terms of trying to use all of that space as efficiently as possible. But I think it's also really important to be looking at your markets of who were, who were growing this food for and being culturally appropriate. Um, I don't want to force kale down anyone's throat. So, um, yeah, that's definitely something I look forward to expanding um, on next year. Agreed. I mean, I, and I would just add, I think, you know, I experimented with kale last year. And like Lindsay was saying, having having them in the ground all season um, and taking up that space, you know, is it worth it? Certainly it's worth it with tomatoes um, because that's, you know, a lot of revenue comes in from tomatoes, but something like kale, you know, not worth 
taking up a significant amount of space for the whole year when it's, you know, really not going to bring much of a return. Um, and then you also think, you know, there's things I think you can grow most of, you know, most of what you can grow at ground level, you can grow on a roof. Uh Um, but there are, you know, there's different, it's a different environment, obviously. Um, one thing on roofs that you contend with is wind. It's real windy up there. Um, so you have to, just make sure you're trellising aggressively, et cetera, to, to, you know, accommodate for, um, you know, some different conditions that, you know, you face on a roof. When you're looking at these, at these containers, um, you know, the, the a milk crate's about pretty much a cubic foot, right? It's a, you know, yeah. 12 inch by 12 inch by, by mm-hmm. 12 inches deep, more or less. I'm, I, I think there are some different dimensions depending on the brand and everything, but, you know, so it's about, I mean, it's about seven gallons of soil. And when you're, when you're seeding those, how do you go about doing that? I mean, if you're putting in a crop like arugula um, or, or other salad greens, are you, are you just broadcasting the seed in there? Are you planting it in rows? What does that look like? I do three rows. So for any uh, like greens, like arugula, spinach, um, Actually, spinach, I do two rows, but or but salad, like cutting greens for a salad mix. I do three rows, um, it, three rows per crate. Um, I think find that to be a cleaner, easier harvest. And um, I guess I just and that's more just me copying my patterns of, you know, in ground farming, too. But for arugula and cutting greens, doing three rows per crate uh, and then with uh, spinach doing like two rows per crate. and we. Um, yeah, we, we direct seed all of our cutting greens um, and, you know, root crops. And then we're doing transplants from um, a, the Food Project, which is a really wonderful local organization that I also work for about a half a mile from us. And so they have three commercial greenhouses right in the city, which is this wonderful resource. And so they've, they've been growing a lot of our starts for us. And then another farm, uh, Three Sisters Farm outside of the city. Uh, grew a lot of our summer crops for us. So then we're transplanting those in. Chris, I, I will say one we we have in the past at, at the other location um, broadcast arugula exclusively. Uh, we, you know, we grow and sell so much arugula um, that, you know, that's typically how we seeded arugula then. Um, but followed most of what Lindsay was talking about for, for other crops, other greens. And then when you're putting those greens in, is that just by hand, you're just sprinkling the seeds into a furrow or, or broadcasting them over the crate in the case at the, at the design center. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause there, cause you can't really use any, everything's by hand. It's, I find it'd be more of a pain to use any other kind of implement um, than uh, my own lovely hands. <laughs> so yeah, you're literally just um, sprinkling, which I know as a, most farmers are like, Oh my gosh, that sounds terrible. You get used to it. I have a really good sprinkle hand now, you know? Um, you, you, uh, but yeah, it's all, it's all by hand. It's too small of an area to really be using any kind of cedar or otherwise. And I'll just say as somebody who's recently made the transition from farming to gardening, like that whole idea of sprinkling seeds in by hand and trying to get yeah. them even and, and consistent, that's really hard. It totally is. And luckily I have come, I've, both done larger scale commercial organic farming um, with all the implements and gadgets. And I, before here was farming in California for three and a half years on like an acre, well, it was 450 acres, but we were doing like two acres, which was all hand farming. Um, And so I'm definitely used to uh, not not relying on too many implements. I mean, we were using cedars there, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because you are using some more, of the gardening techniques as opposed to farming techniques on, on a rooftop farm and then trying to make them as efficient as possible. Um, and I guess practice makes perfect, but yeah. I guess that with the soil that's blended uh, from ingredients and, and doesn't actually have any, any dirt in it, you must not have any weeds. That, so that, that would be nice if that were the case, but Weeds seem to just magically appear on rooftops somehow still, which is still I, seems quite a mystery to me. But I mean, birds, wind. Um, I was just when Vermont Composting Company was out last week, there's this one seed that I actually have this weed that I've never seen before. I have no idea what it is. And I was like, why? What, what, what got into your mix? And they're like, that's not from our mix. We don't, we've never seen that. I don't know what that is. And so that just happened to, I don't know, blow in on a day. I'm not sure how. So things do 
still blow in. There are weeds. The first year, there's definitely less weeds. John, I think, can probably talk more to as the years go on, you get more and more weeds. But the wind and birds and uh, nature still finds a way to bring weeds into your life on the roof. And and insects. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, am- it's amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, we our first year we had very little weeds and sort of the weed pressure grew as the years uh, passed. I think it puts a point on how important um, it is to buy a quality uh, compost and soil. Um, I, you know, I wonder, you know, some of the vendors that we've used in the past, whether that was a mistake or not. Um, and even where you're buying your plants, um, I think also, you know, our pests coming in, uh, I mean, certainly that's possible, but, um, I know we had hornworm one year and I, I suspect it was because we sort of took some plants from a guy that was looking to get rid of them. We didn't, you know, necessarily know him, not very necessarily a, a reputable source. Um, and I think that's sort of how we ended up getting hornworm one year. Um, but you know, it, in some ways it's kind of really cool. I think in the fact that you, you know, you build, it's like, if you build it, they will come and you know, you're building a, you're building a new green space in a city, uh, that wasn't there before. Um, and you, you know, bees find you, uh, ladybugs find you, uh, all sorts of, you know, beneficials and, and otherwise uh, do do find you on the roof, you know, a positive thing in some ways and also can be, you know, you have to still deal with some stuff that you think, you know, you might not have to deal with since you're on a rooftop. Yeah, I think you kind of touched on that job. I think that's one of the things that's kind of amazed me of is like how how life will emerge even on a rooftop three or four stories above in like the heart of a city of how quickly we have this little ecosystem on our roof already of the, we, within a few weeks, we had this in, amazing amount of ladybugs just showing up that probably came in, you know, some eggs on some of the transplants, but there was just this huge population. Um, and we have butterflies and dragonflies and we, we have, we brought in two beehives. So we have bees, which are really great in kind of, helpers on the farm but it, it is amazing yeah you know, and the weed seeds that come on but how fast it's it, it does create its own little ecosystem up there even within a few months and are you guys i assume if if you do have to spray that you guys are using organic techniques for controlling the the insect pests yeah. absolutely yeah we haven't this year had to do anything it's it's been pretty under control you know a little here a little there more cabbage moth than I'm dealing with right now. Um, but yeah, we're strictly organic in our practices. But not certified organic, right? No, no, it wouldn't make sense for us to. At the, I mean, just because the hospital is our entire market uh, at BMC and at higher ground, it's more the connections and people that know the story of the food that um, to me with certification makes sense in some settings. And I think if you can have the partnership and with the people who are buying or consuming your food that I don't think I don't bother or wouldn't bother going through certification process. Agreed. Yeah. I think it makes sense depending on the market that you're serving. But, you know, as Lindsay said, the people that buy our food and eat our food can come, come to our farm and meet us and talk to us and see us. We're right there. I mean, that's the benefit of being in a city um, in that you can really closely connect to the folks that are eating your food. Um, So yeah, I mean, I think philosophically, Lindsay and I both prefer organic methods, and um, and you know, folks, if they want to, if they want to verify that, they can come visit us. With that, we're going to stop here, take a break, get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with John Stoddard and Lindsay Allen of Higher Ground Farm. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are often mistaken for just a rototiller, but it is truly a superior piece of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy, where small farms are a way of life, BCS tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability that every farm needs. I've worked with BCS tractors for over 24 years. And I wouldn't consider anything else for my small tractor needs. And I'm not the only fan. More than 1.5 million people in 50 countries have discovered the advantages of owning Europe's most popular two-wheel tractor. And these really are small tractors with the kinds of features found on their four-wheel cousins and a wide array of equipment. Power harrows, rotary plows, flail mowers, snow throwers, sickle bar mowers, chippers, log splitters, and more and more all the time. BCSamerica.com has photos and videos of BCS in action. Totally a fun site to check it out. BCSamerica.com. 
The Farmer to Farmer podcast is also brought to you by Store It Cold's CoolBot. The CoolBot has changed the way that farmers think about cooling facilities for their vegetables by making it possible to cool a walk-in cooler with a window air conditioning unit with massive savings on the front end and ongoing electricity and maintenance cost savings on the back end. And now they've taken another step forward and they've created a turnkey refrigeration solution, an energy efficient walk-in cooler designed for easy assembly by you in hours, not days. I know from experience how much time and energy can go into building a not so great homemade walk-in cooler or in looking for a used one that's still in good condition. Save yourself the time, save yourself the money, and make your produce stand out in the marketplace when it lasts on store shelves, in restaurant walk-ins, and in your customers' refrigerator drawers because you sold it to them cold. If you're purchasing the CoolBot, please use the code FDF at checkout to double your CoolBot warranty at no charge or mention Farmer to Farmer and receive an exclusive discount on your walk-in cooler. Storeitcold.com. All right, and we're back with Lindsay Allen and John Stoddard of Higher Ground Farm in Boston, Massachusetts. We've been we've been talking a lot about the technical side of things, and there's a couple more technical things that I want to make sure that we cover before we move on. But in all of the pictures that I've seen of the two farming operations, the irrigation seems to feature prominently, and it's not irrigation like I've usually seen on a production vegetable farm. Can you tell me a little bit more about the irrigation system that you've got? Yeah. Well, I can talk about the one at um, Boston Medical Center, and it's a little bit different over at the first location at Higher Ground Farm. And I'll let John talk about that one. But the one that we're using uh, at Boston Medical Center is a weathermatic system. Uh, it's amazing. It's it, Instead of using a drip system, they are root emitters. So they're subsurface um, emitters so the the water actually never daylights and they traditionally they're what's used in like commercial nursery settings where you'd put one in each pot and so we have um yeah in-ground root emitters for each container and then that's hooked up to a weathermatic system which is tied in has a weather sensor actually on the farm and so it tracks the weather it has it tracks evapotranspiration rates and it will shut off and if it's rained and tracks the rain um, that's happening on the farm. So we end up saving a lot of off water that way. And we can, it's also tied into, you can remotely control it from your smartphone. Uh, so it's very high tech, um, kind of the latest in irrigation technology that we were lucky enough to, to get on the farm. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, so yeah, we run it, um, we have it scheduled to run every day because one thing that with rooftop farming that I've observed is that there, because of the wind, you lose so much to evaporation and things just dry. And because things are raised up, obviously they're not in ground. So you just you lose a ton to evaporation. Uh, and so we have, yeah, we're watering every day, but it's extremely low energy output from me because it's all an automated system that I can fiddle around with and add a five minutes here to, and it's divided up into four sections too. And so depending on what crop I can change my uh, amount of water based on that crop. Yeah, it's pretty great. Uh, it can also detect if there's like a break in the system. So if water's, you know, surging out of, a, out of, you know, something breaks and as far as the connections go, um, which has happened to me, uh, you know, if you're if you're farming on a roof and all of a sudden water is flooding everywhere, you're, you're certainly risking um, the buildings below or the, you know, the, the floors below and damaging those. Um, we had a we had an issue at Boston Design Center location where where a connection burst and we had a little bit of water damage. Thankfully, it wasn't so bad below and our and we, you know, our insurance covered it. But that's certainly something that after having that experience, I know how important it is. So to be able to get an, an alert, um, well, they not only alert you, but they'll shut the, wa- the water off uh, with this irrigation system that we have at, at Boston Medical Center. So it's uh, pretty great. And I don't have a ton to say about the Boston uh, Design Center location as far as irrigation goes. It's not as high tech. Again, you know, this is four years ago that it, it was installed or five years ago, actually, that it was installed. And uh, it's drip irrigation. So uh, not the same as the, you know, the uh, in-ground emitters and, you know, controlled basically, you know, we don't have sort of the Internet uh, connection to it. Um, so it's just sort of, you know, set based on uh, how much water time you want throughout the day and in the different zones. Certainly 
Irrigation is a wonderful thing. Saves, <laughs> saves a lot of time for you. It is interesting to me with, with the, the situation that you're talking about growing in these milk crates, because I think in some ways you can probably afford to over irrigate in a way that you might not be able to in a lot of soils where, where you don't have the, the kind of primo drainage that you have with essentially a potting soil in there. Yeah, definitely. Cause we yeah, the roof, it can drain through and drain off and we're definitely trying to not waste any water. So we're, I, haven't done this, but it's on my to-do list of kind of pulling out a few of the crates and then testing, putting a solid bucket underneath so I can test if we're having any run through, which I don't think we are. I've had to actually increase over the past week um, how much we're watering because things are really drying out um, there. But we are, we're trying to get that perfect amount where we're not having any kind of water moving through and draining out of the system. There's the worry of overwatering and having you know nutrients just basically okay. going down the drain so I, it's definitely important to strike that balance um you, yeah you don't you know you, you don't worry about drainage but i guess you worry about sort of the other side of it of of whether or not you're watering your nutrients right out of out of your planter uh we noticed you know after four years at higher ground that there are spots of infertility where the emitters are so you can actually see that even just you know, within an individual crate that there are, there are places in the individual milk crate where the, where the fertility is lower. I mean, like, you know, for example, seeding arugula, um, you know, as we, as we, when we were getting started, obviously you first saw germination uh, under the emitter. Uh, and then what we were seeing actually was the reverse. You know, we, we would see sort of a ring around where the emitter was, where the, where things were germinating or, or just not growing quite as vigorously under the emitter. John, you mentioned a, an issue when you had a water line break, an irrigation mm -hmm. line break uh, back mm -hmm. at the design center. Yep. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the structural considerations and, and location choices and, and how you go about finding a roof to farm on? Sure, yeah. So when we when we knew we wanted to do this uh we you know we we set about looking for a roof and actually recover green roofs um came on many you know location visits with us because they're really the experts in this um but what we knew we we knew we needed uh, certain things from a roof access is super important so how do you get there how do you get stuff up there um and then there's the additional consideration of can visitors safely come up and down from the roof? Is it accessible to folks that uh, might not be able to climb stairs, et cetera? So there's, you know, there's that consideration. Access would be would be a big one. Um, another thing was size. Uh, we knew that for the business model that we were looking at, that we we wanted something that was at least twenty thousand square feet. Another thing was the condition of the roof. So if you're going to be putting anything on top of a roof that's, you know, permanent or semi-permanent, uh, you don't want, obviously, any uh, leaks happening from the roof. So you want to make sure that, you know, the roof is in good condition. Uh, ideally, it's five years old or less. Um, even more ideally, you put a new roof down, which is what Boston Medical Center did. And then the benefit to them is they put a new roof down. We basically covered the whole uh, roof with uh, like an AstroTurf fabric and then the planters. And what that's going to do is protect their roof from the elements. So they'll, they're going to get, you know, double or triple uh, their uh, length of their, of their roof membrane by putting this, by putting this farm on top of it. Another important thing for us was just enthusiastic, you know, having an enthusiastic landlord. Um, so, you know, a landlord that saw the benefit of this, certainly Boston Medical Center does. Um, and then the folks at Boston um, Design Center, I, you know, I think they see it as something that's a, you know, great PR for them, et cetera. Um, so having, you know, having that, that buy-in from, from the landlord uh, is also important. Yeah. And I think with Boston Medical Center, what was another reason why this roof was chosen? I mean, A, because this roof that it's on was actually leaking and had some issues. And so they need to replace it anyway. So they figured might as well have this for the farm. And then it 
by, I think one of the cost saving pieces in rooftop farming can be that, as John mentioned, it can extend the life two to three times the normal length of, of when you would have to replace the roof again. So it's a long return time in terms of cost investment. Um, but I think for larger businesses, or in, you know, in this case, hospitals, it's a cost saving benefit with all of these other multitude of factors that have, you know, benefit factors as well. In the location, we're on like the third roof, um, the third story um, roof of a building that's kind of below one of the main uh, buildings at Boston Medical Center that has a completely, I think it's 10 or 12 story glass back to it with three of our main clinics in that building. And so we really wanted to have the farm located where uh, there was visible access for patients and visitors to the hospital. And so that hospital gets thousands of visitors every day who get to see, they can't physically go onto the farm necessarily, but they can visually interact. So constantly when I'm up there farming, I'm looking up and there are people waving down at you. There's people with their wheelchairs just facing, looking out, watching. And I think that that's not to be undervalued, the kind of therapeutic qualities of having a green space um, that is visible to a hospital and hopefully more and more accessible to more of the hospital's patients there. So that was definitely a key point point of like not wanting it to be a hidden farm, but wanting it to be highly visible mm-hmm. to the visitors and patients of uh, Boston Medical Center. I think that's yeah. huge. Having spent way huge. too much time in, in hospitals over the last mm. year and a half, the, mm. the, just the amount of ugly that you encounter Oof, so there, true. looking out the windows, unless somebody's actually taken the time to think about it. And it, I feel like it does, it does actually have an impact and, uh, right. you know, just uh, speak from experience. So I, I, I appreciate that consideration that went into that. I mean, there, yeah. there have been, there have been studies done on just the benefit of having green space visible from yeah. your window, um, just improving productivity of employees and improving sort of your general disposition. Um, so I think it does, um, you know, play into sort of the whole, angle of of health and and yeah. providing an environment in a hospital or or in any you know business where where yeah. people are um able to see a green space and really feeling you know just the way it affects them sort of on a uh i don't know if it's spiritual level or whatnot but just having yeah. sort of that benefit to sort of improve their their mood and et cetera. Yeah. And I think that's what needs is neat too about Boston medical center is they're also in parts of the hospital where you can't see the farm. They have live screens with different, um, you know, photos and shots streaming of the farm, um, up in different parts of the hospital. They also, from the demonstration kitchen, they do like live, um, uh, recorded, um, like videoed, um, cooking classes too, that get, um, actually projected into patients rooms as an option for them to watch. So you can be like learning how to cook with what's happening right in the center too. So they're really like, creative and, uh, with the ways that they are trying to yeah, make a space, um, healthier in a lot of layers there at Boston medical center. Does having a camera on you and having all of these people watching you uh, and kind of like, you know, turning farming into a spectator sport does it does that kind of give you the creeps sometimes yeah um i mean there's not that much there's not like a live stream of us ever if there's you know there's people take photos and they go up on there but yeah sometimes i forget about it. i was once i was having lunch up there a few weeks ago and it's like oh, i'm just gonna close lay down and close my eyes for a second and then i was like wait i think people are gonna think i'm dead um <laughs> you know i'm laying out there uh just trying to catch a wink and then looked up and there's, you know, all these people looking down at me. Um, so, you know, it's across the street, so it's not so close and personal that, um, it feels intrusive. I think it's fun. Um, and I wish there was a way for people to actually be able to come onto the farm more easily than there is right now. Cause I think, I think in urban farming, so much of what we have to offer is like what I think of as the alternative harvest. And that's like the knowledge and the, 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 the green space that we create um, on farms for people to be able to interact, whether that's just visually or walking through or as a learning space as a classroom. And so that's really, I think, important. Now, the two locations that you have, the rooftops are pretty different. I mean, you know, one's kind of right out on the on the harbor. The other one's kind of, you know, a little bit more in, in what what seems to be a light industrial area. Um, yeah. Can you tell me about the differences, the, the advantages and disadvantages for, for locating that way? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, like I like I mentioned at the Boston Design Center location, it's by the ocean, so um, you know, it's it's probably even windier. It's also higher, so it's probably even windier than than the uh, Boston Medical Center location. And we have seagulls up there, um, which is kind of unique in the sense of, uh, you know, those birds have been there longer than I have nesting. Um, so just trying to contend with them they get pretty territorial during you know in the nesting phase um <laughs> and when the when there's babies but you know we actually pretty much learn to live with them and they learn to live with us and you know i think we actually i really believe that they learn to trust us um after a while um but you know as far as location goes you know there, there's that to contend with and and but it's also kind of really in the heart of as i was mentioning a neighborhood that really has a lot of restaurants and that's not far from other neighborhoods. Um, you know, I was delivering produce on bike for several years and could just easily bike to the north end and to the south end from our location. So I would say it's um it's a pretty good central location to be able to uh you know if if you're in the market of selling to restaurants that that worked really well for us. Um and it, and and you know as that neighborhood grows there's only more more folks to sell to, um, even, you know, small markets, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, the Boston medical center location, you know, the, the best thing about it is that all foods going, well, not the best thing, but as far as sort of moving product goes, um, the best thing is just that it's, it's right on site. You know, it's kind of a dream to not have to be, uh, you know, delivering, going around town, et cetera, and, and dealing with orders, et cetera. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a beautiful thing to be able to grow and, and then deliver right to the kitchen on site. Right. Like um, where there's no fossil fuels in that delivery. It's like, no. it's a, you know, a few thousand feet that I'm pushing my big metal cart of produce through the hospital, which is yeah. its own really unique experience of literally wheeling, you know, like hundreds of pounds of vegetables by the intensive care unit and then sharing a hot, you know, the elevators with doctors and physicians and everyone. and um which I think is also another benefit of these great conversations that end up happening um, in the, the elevators. I have to take three different elevators to deliver the food, um, which means <laughs> interacting with some, a lot of different, you know, patients and um, employees and facilities workers and doctors. And um, I think that's a really fun piece of it too. I'm discovering there's a lot of more gardeners in the world than I, you know, maybe thought there were. <laughs> And, you know, I would, I would just echo Lindsay's statements is it's, you know, at both locations, you see people really light up about this stuff. They oh seem gosh, yeah. so excited. They always want to talk about it. They always, you know, like it's, 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 it's a nice thing to be able to sort of, I don't know, just see people's reactions and see sort of, I think people are like yearning for, for this kind of stuff. Um, everyone wants to see it. It's, it's something that really excites people. So it's, it's a cool thing to, you know, be involved with to, to see people really just, you know, so interested in it and so excited about it. Yeah, there's definitely like a lot of BMC employee pride around the farm. It's like whenever I'm walking around with produce and people are like, oh, is that from the rooftop farm? Oh, my gosh, I can't wait to come up. I just signed up to volunteer on Tuesday, you know. And so people we do volunteer. I do a volunteer um afternoon every tuesday now and it's you know completely booked up for the next month and we haven't released like the next dates um so we have people just clamoring to want to engage with it and uh, i think that's another you know one of the other benefits too is for the staff and employees of boston medical center which i think there's something like five thousand five hundred um, employees of bmc but being able to add another layer of work experience or like work um i don't know places to interact and engage with. And yeah, you know, we just had with the um, demonstration kitchen two weeks ago, we partnered up with the, the HR department had an iron chef competition. So they came up and they divided into two groups and they had to, they, with myself and my assistant, Hillary, um, help them harvest different ingredients. And they had to bring that back to the demonstration kitchen and, you know, have a cooking competition there. And so trying to just figure out different fun ways to get employees um, onto the roof and engaging with it as well. And, you know, bought into what we're doing. So it's really clear that you guys have the cool factor 
cover, right? I mean, growing on, growing on a rooftop is pretty badass. And, and, right? but how does it look economically? I know at the, at the Boston Medical Center, you're really talking about, you know, a, a fee for service sort of a farming. They're, they're hiring you guys to do it. But when we go to the Boston Design Center, what do the economics look like of actually running a for profit farm on a rooftop in downtown Boston? Yeah, it's, it's really tough. Um, so, you know, the way I usually talk about this is that, you know, you look at a production based model or you look at a, a model where you're relying on sort of uh, like non agricultural activities or, you know, so essentially, you know, for us being so small, we definitely do not generate enough revenue um, to really like have a full staff, um, et cetera. So the way I see other farm, other rooftop farms really making their money is by having um, events. Like I know Brooklyn Grange in New York, uh, New York City, they have weddings up there, yoga classes, all types of different programming. Something I would love to do at my location if we had legal access, we have a stairwell, but we do not have an elevator. And according to the, you know, uh, American, uh, Dis Americans Disabilities Act, don't know the exact name of it. Um, you know, you need in order to have public up there, everyone needs to be able to reach the farm. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't we can't draw from that type of revenue. Um, so, the, you know, the other way to go is production based uh, purely, which I would say you could look at Lufa Farms in in Montreal. Um, they're a rooftop farm. I think they have two. Uh, they do they grow hydroponically. Um, it's not really a place for visitors. Um, you know, not that they don't have visitors, but they're you know their way they're they're generating their revenue is through um, you know growing pretty intensively um, throughout the year because they have a greenhouse. Um, so you know for for the Boston Design Center location, it's it's definitely a struggle. Uh, it's been really a labor of love for me over these past few years, um, and I'm I'm you know currently really like reevaluating how to make that site work um, economically. Yeah, and I think it's not to uh, yeah. I think that right now there. I know in, um, we just closed out a grant cycle here in Boston with the USDA Urban Agriculture uh, that we're putting out and really calling in for large proposals for urban farming. And I think that there is starting to be a lot more money um, and startup grant money out there uh, for urban farmers. Um, and so I think that that can, those kind of situations can help with a lot of the upfront costs. And then I think partnering though with Boston medical center now we're there, they've kind of, they're covered the cost. They had a large donor base that wanted to fund this project. So we're very lucky in that um, aspect, but that I could, that I think that those are some really large untapped markets of money to support uh, rooftop and other urban farming um, initiatives is through partners with hospitals and larger um, and colleges where there is a huge revenue, a huge amount of food coming into these systems every day. Um, and that would be able to support them. I think that right now we're at a spot with, you know, rooftop farming that it, there is a large upfront cost that is real. Um, but there's also a lot of room for creativity and a lot of room for partnerships. And I think it's also not to be undervalued what John, what you were saying of the, for me, like when I hear of a farm that isn't allowed to have people on there, or for me, I'm not interested in like hydroponics at all, but it's, I, I, for me, farming is yes about the food, but it's about the community building and it's about the relationships of the human aspect of, of, of what we create there. And so I'm not interested in a farm that can't have humans on it. And so for me, it's really interesting to think of what in an urban setting, what are those other um, educational opportunities that that could be, um, you know, other revenue streams as well. And I know for some people farming, they don't actually like interacting with humans that much. And that's why they're interacting with plants. So that's not, you know, that urban farming might not be the best place for someone who's not more of a human, you know, community centered uh, person as well. I mean, you look at like, you know, some folks that are that are successful that are, you know, have actual, you know, fairly successful 
rooftop farming businesses or, or urban farming businesses, you know, some folks are are literally like investors and and sort of entrepreneurs that don't really have connections to farming, but they see a market for local food and they've done that, you know, and, and so there's there's examples of those folks. Um, and then there's sort of the other side of what of what Lindsay's saying of, of folk that, you know, maybe have more of a um, sort of a community based mission. You know, they're like a mission driven organization rather than sort of seeing an economic opportunity um, to be to be realized. Um, but really, you know, thinking about the business model of how you make uh, urban farming generally work. I mean, you see it w working with nonprofits. Um, you, like I mentioned, you see it if, if you can sort of involve, um, other types of programming that bring in, a, you know, revenue for, you know, in the form of weddings, et cetera. Um, and you see it like Lindsay was saying in these types of partnerships where it's not really, you're not growing food for sale. You're, you're growing food for an institution or for, you know, it could be even like a, a corporate office park. I mean, but it's it, that's more of sort of you know it's it's different than than what you see with a with a rural or suburban farm um so finding a way to you know if you believe in ur urban agriculture finding a way to make it work and be creative so you know it might be this this fee for service model it might be uh the brooklyn grange model it, you know or it could be more of like the lufa farms model um but you know, there's, there's different ways to make it work. And, you know, I think they're all valuable. Um, right. but yeah. Well, and I think there's, like, there's definitely a wrap that, um, rooftop farms have that are very expensive to start up, which they are, but I think relative to other farm startup costs, there are hard costs that can't be as flexible as some of the startup costs of a, a you know suburban rural farm but we aren't paying for a tractor we aren't paying for a lot of the the upfront costs that are pretty significant in starting a farm in a non-urban setting and so i i there is yeah i don't think there's as big of a um economic difference for startup if we're ta if we really bring into those other factors that that farms are contending with um and then i could just say in terms of like production wise i farmed you know i farmed in Illinois, in Massachusetts, in California, in Tanzania, all, a lot of places. And I have never had per square foot so much food come out of one space. I mean, we're, we, we're cranking food out of here. And so I think if we were actually on this farm, a for-profit entity, and had found a way to have our initial upfronts with some of the grants, which would have been easy to do to cover those initial costs, we would be um, doing quite well for ourselves. Lindsay, what, I mean, you talked about production, you know, more production per square foot than you've seen on any other farm that you've been on. So what does that actually look like? I mean, what kind of numbers are you producing there at the farm? Yeah, so we we have we're about one month in um, for harvesting and we've uh, harvested 2000 pounds um, and that's basically all in greens. A few, you know, a few hundred pounds in radishes, but that's all in um cutting greens, lettuce heads, bok choy, uh, arugula, spinach. Um, and so, and that's, we're producing on about 2,300 um, square feet. Um, and about, but of course about only about half of that is in different kinds of greens production. So the numbers um, have been, I, I'm, I'm impressed by how fast things are growing. And, um, and so that's, and it's basically evenly split at this point where um, about a thousand pounds have gone to the kitchen of, uh, um, and then a thousand pounds have gone to the food pantry and that's our first month. And so we're hoping, um, by the, you know, that we'll wrap things up at the end of October on the farm and aiming to grow between 10,000 and 15,000 pounds, um, of food, which is really a guess because I'm not used to a rooftop setting, but, um, we, yeah, we'll see, um, how that goes. With that, we're going to switch to our lightning round. We're going to get a quick word from a sponsor and then we'll be right back. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by the amazing people at Vermont Compost Company, where they've been helping plants make sugar from sunshine since 1992. Through 25 years of producing the best potting soils you can buy, Vermont Compost Company founder and owner Carl Hammer has stayed intimately involved in the company, working with a small staff of committed individuals to provide compost-based potting soils chock full of microbial partners and humus-bound nutrients. 
The people at Vermont Compost Company have a practical understanding of the challenges organic growers face, and they combine that with a comprehensive understanding of soil and plant science and this really amazing intuitive comprehension of what's going on where the roots and the fungi do their magic. Like the folks at Higher Ground, when I grew crops to maturity in containers at Rock Spring Farm, I relied on Vermont Compost Company potting soils precisely because of the intelligence, intuition, experience, and patience that goes into creating their products. And I can't imagine relying on anything else. Feed your plants the best. VermontCompost.com John, you've been doing the rooftop farming for longer than Lindsay has, so I'm going to ask you, what's the weirdest thing? that's happened on your rooftop farm (laughs) the weirdest thing oh man uh i mean i'll go back to the seagulls where i basically had to get a water gun and (laughs) i used the top of a a, like a metal trash can lid because they had nested by the irrigation controller and i had to get in there and make some adjustments and they were particularly i had two particularly aggressive seagulls that would be charging me so I really had to sort of arm myself to get them, uh, you know, to get in and do what I needed to do. And there's been, I mean, there's, I have a million seagull stories, but it's certainly contending with seagulls that can be a little aggressive when they have an egg in the nest. Any particular water gun that you recommend for dealing with seagulls? <laughs> a big, powerful one. Cause those birds are not, they are frightening. I mean, they, they, they're not messing around up there. Um, but you know, like I said earlier, it's, It's, uh, you do, they do learn to sort of trust you, but during that initial phase where they're nesting, uh, they can be pretty aggressive. So you gotta, uh, make sure you, you know, you protect yourself. And I think the water gun fairly harmless, but also sends a message. Lindsay, what's your favorite crop to grow? Mm, Probably, which I'm not growing on this farm, but garlic. I love growing garlic, you know, takes up that space and the season when nothing else would be growing garlic scapes are just about the darned most delicious food. And yeah, I think garlic would be up there for me. I think it's pretty magical uh, health benefits due to it. I'm getting my, my master's in agroforestry. So I'm very into trees and perennial crops as well. So it's going to be interesting to, to take your present career and, and uh, match that up with what you're doing for an education. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Well, the rooftop is, I think, my uh, interim while I'm getting my master's, and um, my background has been more in perennial and um, agroforestry based farming. John, what's Lindsay's farming superpower? My goodness, I don't know. Uh, she, I think, she is efficient, knowledgeable, and uh, and loves to loves to you know teach about it. Loves to engage with people. So she's great with plants and people. And John, again, since you're the one with the the length of experience with the rooftop farming, I'm going to ask you, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing back in 2013, what would it be? Oh, man. Uh, You know, I've talked about this a little bit before. I started this really idealistically. You know, I... I really come from sort of an advocate background. I've been in, you know, environmental advocate, food system advocate for for years now um, and gone to school for both things. Um, And I really just wanted in in starting this farm to, you know, create, you know, as they say, the change I wanted to see in the world. Um, And I think that idealistic sort of uh, approach really helped in a way because it, um, you know, knowing what I know now, like, would I still do it? Would I still, uh, because, you know, it, it's challenging, particularly at, at the design center where, you know, it's just a challenging business model. So, um, in some ways I might not tell my, myself anything because, uh, you know, we wouldn't have what we have today. And I think this has been really a project that involves just like creativity you know, figuring out how to make things work, everything from, you know, the farm level of growing stuff and, and dealing with the unique environment to the, to the business. So, you know, I, I personally have no regrets about it because it's been a really awesome creative endeavor that I think has brought a lot, I hope, to the city. Um, so, you know, I think the, the benefit is sort of being a little um, naive about what it takes and being a little idealistic was probably good for me. Um, so I might just keep my mouth shut and not tell myself anything. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. 
John and Lindsay, thank you so much for being on the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. Oh, thank you so much for having us. This was great. It was great to be here. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 128 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for higher ground. That's H I G H E R G R O U N D. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk behind farming equipment and high quality garden tools in North America. And by Rock Dust Local, the first company in North America specializing in local sourcing and delivery of the best rock dust and biochar for organic farming. And by Local Food Marketplace, providing an integrated, scalable solution for farmers and food hubs to process customer orders, including online ordering, harvesting, packing, delivering, invoicing, and payment processing. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, please head over to iTunes, leave us a review if you enjoy the show. It makes a huge difference in our ability to reach new members of the audience. Or talk to us in the show notes. Tell your friends on Facebook. We'd love to talk to you on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show directly by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. And finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmertofarmerpodcast.com, and I will do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.